and welcome to our last video here in our evolution unit of biology. Here we're going to talk about the history of life on Earth. And so again, I've gone with this diagram of the deep history of Earth and some of the events that have occurred over time. The question that we're trying to answer here is how has life progressed on Earth? How have we gotten from the beginning of life, something that looks like modern day bacteria, to the modern era of Snapchatting humans? So in this video, we're gonna talk about the major events that we see in the history of life on Earth. We're not gonna talk about all of them. We're just gonna spotlight a couple of examples and some of the patterns that we see in life's history. And so we're going to use the evolution of photosynthesis as our example of how we go about getting evidence of events that occurred deep in the past history of Earth. So it seems like the earliest date to the origin of life is about 4 billion years ago, and the earliest start to photosynthesis is somewhere around 3.2 billion years ago. And so the question is, how do we know this? Well, the first way that we know this is that we can go and we can find fossilized evidence. So these are fossils of stromatolites from about 3.5 billion years ago. And here's a modern collection of stromatolites. Stromatolites are structures that we can investigate in the modern world, and we find that they are in fact made by bacteria called cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria. And since we find stromatolite structures in the fossil record, it's not unreasonable to conclude that they were being built by photosynthetic bacteria back then, just like they are today. This is what's referred to as the heterotroph hypothesis, which is the notion that life evolves initially as heterotrophic organisms, organisms that basically eat other organisms or molecules from their environment. And then photosynthesis evolves later, about a billion years later. And when considering the evolution of photosynthesis, it's not a bad idea to consider what we think has happened to the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. So early in the beginning of Earth's history, we don't think that there was any oxygen, free oxygen, O2, in Earth's atmosphere at all. And it's thought that all of the oxygen that is currently in the atmosphere is a direct result of the photosynthetic activity of organisms that carry out the process. As photosynthesis evolved, there should be a period of time where the atmosphere of the Earth is oxygenating, as the oxygen levels in the atmosphere are increasing. And in fact, we see evidence to support this, not just in the fossil record, but also in the geological record of the Earth. So this is a banded iron formation. Essentially, a banded iron formation is just a collection of rust. And without getting too much into the chemistry behind rust, rust is what we get when iron combines with oxygen. And the thinking that explains this is that as photosynthetic organisms evolved and start to photosynthesize and produce oxygen into the atmosphere, that oxygen starts to react with the free iron that is in the environment, particularly in the ocean, and causes the formation of iron oxide. The iron oxide is insoluble, it precipitates out, it falls down, and over time we get these layers of banded iron, which is actually where we get a good amount of the iron that we use in modern steel. But we see these formations all over the place and they all date to the same era of Earth's history. And so this is a great example of the process by which we can get information about what happened in Earth's history before we were ever on the scene to check it out or write it down. Moving now to patterns that we see in life's history, I want to talk about one that may be obvious to you from looking at this graph, or it might not. If you look at this graph of Earth's history, you can see that most of the interesting stuff happens in the last quarter of Earth's history. It actually happens in the last half of the last quarter. That's this notion of accelerated returns in life's history. The idea that life starts slow after it originates, but then we hit these critical points by which the complexity and diversity of life increase exponentially. It's a totally natural thing to wonder, like, why is that the case? How come we didn't get complex multicellular life earlier on in Earth's history? Well, think about some of the things that had to evolve first. I mean, not even the origin of life, let's leave that aside. After the origin of life, you would need to get the evolution of photosynthesis in order to oxygenate the environment, and then the evolution of aerobic cellular respiration, which is the process that's used to generate the ATP that's used by all multicellular life on the planet. We would need to get the development of eukaryotes, and then we would need to get the organization of cells into multicellular organisms. And then we would need to get the development of the body plans that we see in multicellular organisms. All of these things have to get figured out before you can get the wide variety of multicellular life that we see on the planet today. 
And that helps to explain why we get this accelerated rate of increasing diversity as we get closer to present day in Earth's history. In other words, why all the multicellular stuff happens in the last billion years of Earth's life. Now we could look at each of these, but that would make for a long video and it's really beyond the level at which you need to know it for the purpose of this course. So I just want to focus on one thing here. I want to focus on the development of eukaryotes, which is a process that we refer to as endosymbiosis. So you can see that this process occurs somewhere around 2 billion years ago, that transition from prokaryotic cells, cells without any internal membrane-bound organelles, to eukaryotic cells. A really important milestone in the history of life on Earth. Let's go and look at how we think that this happened. If we consider what life looked like before the origin of eukaryotes, everybody was a prokaryote. Some prokaryotes had evolved the ability to photosynthesize, and other prokaryotes had already evolved the ability to engage in aerobic cellular respiration, but many prokaryotes were still anaerobic. They didn't use oxygen in their respiration, and in order to make their living, they basically went out and they ate other organisms. It's thought that one group of these ancient anaerobic prokaryotes engulfed a group of prokaryotes that could carry out aerobic cellular respiration. And instead of digesting them and eating them, instead, over time, those internal aerobic prokaryotes evolved into modern-day mitochondria, which are the organelles present in all eukaryotes that are used for the process of aerobic cellular respiration. This gave rise eventually to all of the cells that are found in all of the animals on the planet, including you and me. But for a subgroup of these modern aerobic eukaryotes, they then engaged in an endosymbiotic process with another group of prokaryotes that had evolved the process of photosynthesis. And again, instead of digesting those prokaryotes, those photosynthetic prokaryotes became the modern day chloroplasts in photosynthetic eukaryotes like plants and algae. This is the theory of endosymbiosis that we use to describe the origin of eukaryotes. Now, of course, I would hope that you would never accept something so fantastical without evidence to support it. So let's talk a little bit about the evidence that supports the endosymbiotic origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts. The first is that there are structural similarities between prokaryotes and mitochondria and chloroplasts. This is comparing a chloroplast, which is a photosynthetic organelle in eukaryotes, with a cyanobacteria, one of those groups of prokaryotes that can carry out photosynthesis. It turns out that they have internal structures that are very similar in terms of the organization of their internal membrane structures. They have their own ribosomes, they have their own DNA. When we look at the ribosomes in a mitochondria or a chloroplast, we see that those ribosomes are similar in structure to the ribosomes that we find in modern day prokaryotes. And they actually differ from the ribosomes that we find in modern day eukaryotes. And of course, the presence of an internal chromosome in mitochondria and chloroplasts means that we can sequence that internal chromosome and see which organisms they're most closely related to. The chromosomes of chloroplasts and mitochondria are not most similar to the DNA that's found in the nuclei of the eukaryotes that contain them. Instead, those chromosome sequences are most similar to the genomes that we find in two different groups of bacteria. Chloroplast genomes are most similar to cyanobacteria, and mitochondrial genomes are most similar to a group of bacteria called proteobacteria, which can carry out aerobic cellular respiration. So I mentioned endosymbiosis not only because it's a cool example for what we're talking about, but also because I think it illustrates a larger point, which is that not only was the early history of life when life was just unicellular and largely prokaryotic, a very long period of time in the history of life on Earth, but it was also a really interesting time. A lot of cool things were happening. There's a lot of exchange of information and structures between the different lineages before the modern three domain system of life that we recognize these days emerged. Some people talk about a network model, other people talk about a ring of life model. You don't need to worry about that. I'm just putting them here because I think that they're really neat. And if you're interested in learning more, you're gonna to need to know what to type into Google to find the answers you're looking for. Let's move on and look at some other patterns in life's history, particularly in the last 500 million years or so. The time period during which there have been macroscopic multicellular life forms on the planet. This is an interesting graph showing extinction intensity in different groups of marine organisms over time. And you can see that periodically over that course of time, we see spikes in the extinction rate. These events are generally referred to as mass extinctions. And there's a lot of debate in the scientific community over what caused them. But whatever the causes are, they had to have been pretty cataclysmic, like asteroids hitting the Earth. That last one over to the right, by the way, is the one that got rid of the dinosaurs. We also see patterns of radiation in life's history. The diversity of organisms that we see in the fossil record over time goes up and down in the short term, but in the long term is an undeniable trend towards maximum 
maximizing the number of different types of organisms that we see on the planet. To the point where we are now living at a period of maximum biodiversity, the actions of humans notwithstanding. You may wonder why we get these radiations of life, and so I'll point you towards this concept from evolutionary biology known as an adaptive radiation. This refers to a rapid, and we put that in quotes because we're talking about geological time, right? So we're talking about tens of millions of years, but a, a rapid divergence in the forms of organisms that we see on the planet. Usually once there's the opportunity for life to diversify into a series of open niches. You can think about what happened to mammals after most of the dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous and how modern day mammals have diversified to fill a lot of niches that used to be filled by dinosaurs. Or you can think about the patterns that we see with organisms like Darwin's finches or other organisms when they arrive at isolated environments like islands where there are no organisms previously inhabiting these open niches. In both cases, the processes of evolution result in one organism giving rise to many diverse forms that come to occupy those empty niches. Of course, we'd be remiss here at the end if we didn't talk about patterns for life in the future. I'm sure it's obvious to you that the biggest deal for non-human life on this planet currently is dealing with the explosion in the human population. To the point where it's thought that perhaps we're living in a brand new geological era, which is sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene. This is an interesting graph that shows the percentage survival in large mammal species once humans arrived on the scene on four different areas of the planet. And you can see that every time humans arrived on the scene, the percentage of large mammal species in the area declined precipitously afterwards. And that is, of course, unfortunately due to our activities in the environment and the way that we interact with the living systems of the world. All of that established, it's really difficult to reach any conclusions about how human activity is going to affect the evolution of life on Earth going into the future. Thanks so much for watching our discussion about life's history on Earth. Please make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how we can investigate the events in life's history. How did we know when photosynthesis evolved on the planet? Make sure you can explain the theory of endosymbiosis and provide examples of the evidence that supports it. And make sure that you can describe patterns in the extinction rate and radiations of life on Earth. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.